Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Exploring Kodawari. Our conversation this time is with speaker, author, and advocate for sobriety, Stephen Hill. Before finding sobriety, Stephen suffered from addiction for over a decade. For a lot of people, it might be hard to understand the struggles of addiction, but if you read his book, you'll realize just how dark it can get, and also what a major success story he is. So for this intro, I figured it would be best to just read a few paragraphs from his book, starting with this passage from the opening. As I awoke on the floor of my hotel room, my eyes fell upon a pile of my own vomit. This was the result of a night of self-destruction. Countless hours snorting lines of oxycotton and cocaine, drinking Red Bull and vodka, chain-smoking Marlboro lights, and playing $1,000 hands of blackjack. At that moment, the luxury of my suite paled in comparison to the debauchery that occurred fewer than 24 hours earlier. I may have overdosed that night. I cannot be sure. The image that I saw in the mirror was a multicolor palette that I had never seen before. My bloodshot eyes lost their natural blue color. My skin, a greenish yellow shade, supplanted a black and blue welt on my head. In an effort to ensure that I would never repeat that awful experience, I promised myself that I would no longer mix substances and would simply stick to my drug of choice, Oxycontin. At the time, that was the best anyone could hope for. End quote. That was from the prologue, and now Stephen has recently celebrated eight years of sobriety on September 30th, 2020. He's in his last semester at Brooklyn Law School and has also started Speak Sobriety, a program where he shares his story at schools, community events, conferences, etc. His book and life really deliver a powerful message and comeback story. And while reading Stephen's book, I was also struck with a similarity that I've found in a book I'm currently reading called A Guide to the Good Life by William Irvine about the ancient philosophy of Stoicism. So I just wanted to quickly emphasize a crucial detail that I found in common between these two books, something we also get deeper into during the episode. Central to the Stoicism philosophy is the crucial difference between framing something that happens to you as a blessing versus framing it as a curse. Even when it's clear that you got screwed over by something, it's always more useful and forward-looking to frame things as a challenge on the path to somewhere greater. And Stephen definitely found a way to frame his challenges as a blessing. I'll read one more short paragraph from the end of his book. Quote, My disease of addiction and my life experience as a result of my actions have been both a blessing and a curse. But the curse for me is over. And today I use my experiences as a blessing. I have been given a chance to use my struggles to prevent someone else from making the same mistakes I did. I am able to give hope to those who feel as helpless as I did during the height of my addiction. End quote. So yeah, I definitely recommend ordering his book, and I put a link to that in the episode notes. Oh, and I forgot to mention Steve is also my cousin, so perhaps the biggest success of this episode is that we managed to avoid just quoting Seinfeld the entire time, which is what usually happens at most family get-togethers. Anyways, thanks for listening, thanks to Steve for coming on, and enjoy the episode. And we are good. All right, Stephen Hill, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So I usually give a short intro, like before the interview starts, but can you give a little bit of a background, who you are, what the heck you've been up to kind of stuff? Sure. Uh, First and foremost, my title is Lucas Spouslov's cousin. That's that's my most important title. Uh, Really? That's on the top of your resume? On the top of my resume. That's that's, That's how I get places. Nice. So I am Stephen Hill. I'm the founder of Speak Sobriety. I've been sharing my story of recovery with middle schools, high schools, colleges, universities, different types of conferences for the, for the past five years, uh, just sharing my story about my struggles with substance abuse and journey to recovery and what that's been like for me trying to prevent the onset of substance abuse and you know motivate people to live a happy and and healthy lifestyle. So I've been doing that for the past four or five years. Um, I also graduated from John Jay College of Criminal Justice with a major in criminal justice. And I'm in my last semester at Brooklyn Law School. And my goal there with my law degree is to advocate for change in the criminal justice system, especially how it relates to uh, drug offenses. And so those are two of my missions kind of combined into one as one overlaps with the other Mm -hmm. and i'm also the author of my memoir a journey to recovery speak sobriety with my co-author mark hoberman who helped me write this book and it's uh it's you know been a very great experience for me right i i just um 
was reading your book over the last two weeks. So for listeners, if the questions seem like direct, the book is very direct. Like you're very explicit yeah. about the stuff you've been up to uh, before you hit your recovery period. Yes, for sure. Yeah, and It was really powerful for sure. I just couldn't stop reading. Like I'm just flipping one page after another. Like It did like, read like a story yeah. almost that you wanted to see. I mean, obviously I know what happens. I know you, but I kind of wanted to see what happens. You made it. Did you do that on purpose? Make it more of like a story that was, you know, it felt like almost like a novel and how it was a story. Yeah. So I definitely ha- had help with that uh, with, from my co-author, Mark Holberman, and we were going for that type of feel. I actually, you're not the first person to say that there was a school nurse who had hired me to come in and speak to their students and to the parents. And before I actually went in and spoke, I had sent her a copy of my book and she was reading it. And she sent me an email that she was kind of at like the height of my addiction in the book. And she said, I know that you're okay because I'm talking with you right now, but I'm almost nervous for you. Like you're not going to be okay. (laughs) while I'm reading this book, even though I know you are because I'm talking to you right now, she said, as I continue to read this, I just, I just kept getting nervous and I just had to keep reading to make sure that you were going to be okay. And so I've, I've gotten that uh, from people before. I felt that I had to be brutally honest. And that is the only way that you're ever going to make real change on these issues. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Some of what I admit and talk about is not easy. You could say there is some shame, some guilt, some embarrassment, things like that. But that's not who I am. It's not who I was. It's definitely not who I am today. It was as a result of my substance use disorder, my addiction. And I think that people need to hear the truth. And that's how we're going to fight this uh, on the treatment end, on the stigma, being able right. to knock down that stigma attached to addiction. So that's why I'm so brutally honest when I wrote this book and every time I speak. Yeah, because you talk about how being honest makes kids actually respect what you're saying. If you're just like, say no to drugs, drugs are bad. If you smoke weed, you'll be a loser forever. Like, they're just going to tune you out. Correct. So... I actually got some guidance early on from my youngest brother, Kevin, your cousin as well. Uh, I know him. Yep. (laughs) So he had heard a speaker and he was a junior in high school. I believe it was either a junior or senior in high school. And it was basically a zero tolerance approach where basically the guy was saying that if you end up with a red solo cup in your hand, in your hand, eventually you're going to end up with a needle in your arm. And that's just, it's just not accurate. It's not true. Sure. It can happen that way. And it does happen that way, but it's not going to happen that way for everyone. And the truth is it's not going to happen that way for most people. Most people in this country do not end up addicted to heroin. And that's, that's the truth, but you don't know who it's going to happen to. You don't know if it's going to happen or how serious that addiction is going to be, if it's going to carry over into mental health. You know, there are a lot of people who struggle with mental health disorders, whether it's depression or anxiety, and the use of substances can send them over the edge, right? Can Mm -hmm. make it that much worse. Uh, People self-medicate as well. Like if you suffer from an anxiety disorder, and this was also something I think that I struggled with from a lot of speakers is they just make it seem like drugs are always all bad. Mm -hmm. And if you're a kid who struggles with anxiety and you are just filled with anxiety all the time and fear and somebody gives you a Xanax for your first time, you're not going to feel worse. You're going to feel better at first. You know, the, the point to remember is, is that it is a controlled substance. It's very, very addictive and you're going to become tolerant. You're going to become dependent on it. And your tolerance is going to go up and you're eventually going to need more to achieve the same effect. And then without it, you get sick, you go through withdrawals and all of that. So that's the point we need to get there. But but don't tell somebody that their first use is, is always going to be a bad experience because a lot of the times it's it's really not. And it's not about the first. It's really about where it, where it can lead to. 
And also, if the first was so bad, why would people be getting addicted to these things? Exactly. You need to concede to certain arguments that uh, this is just the re- this is the reality. And if you're going to try and lie, especially to high school students, especially to juniors and seniors who just, they're at the height of their skepticism already. Yeah, yeah, you can't lie to juniors and seniors. They know what's good. They know what's going on. And if you're just going to sit there and try and like lie to them and be like, yeah, we and do like a little wink, wink. We got them. I mean, I've, I've had some people before, before I go out on, on, on a stage and, and they'll say, you know, scare them straight. I'm like, yeah. What? <laughs> what? Not, you're no. like, no, no, I'm going to do what I do. <laughs> no, you invited I, me here. <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to scare them straight. Fear is not what keeps me sober. It's the complete opposite. It's love. Mm-hmm. That's what keeps you sober. Mm, interesting. Yeah, you could say those two are kind of in competition. And, you know, anger, I've I've heard this described a lot in meditation circles, that anger is just uh, an, a way of expressing fear. Mm. You know, it's a way to mask fear or to like not look at dark things. And probably so is a lot of addiction, right? Would you say that um, the deeper into the addiction hole you get, the more you want to cover up what you've done, the lies you've had to tell and all of that kind of stuff. For sure. And it, it also allows you to put blame onto other people, right? Mm-hmm. The blame game and addiction is huge in yeah. a lot of different ways. And people want to blame, like, I, I, I can't tell you, I remember early on, I, I spoke and, and I share in my, in my book and in both in my presentation about how I was introduced to drugs and alcohol <clears throat> by an older peer, uh, someone who was two years older than me, who was an athlete like I was. And people would say things to me at the beginning, like, I hope he got his, and right. it's like, he's a bad guy. And I'm like, like, what? Like, he was a teenager, just like I was. And he never forced me to do anything. And just like he influenced me, I influenced other people. And he was influenced from someone to begin with. He didn't create drugs and alcohol. And so uh, I don't sit there and blame other people for for my addiction. I mean, yeah, you could throw some blame on the billion dollar pharmaceutical industry for sure. I mean, those are not your troubled teenagers who are using substances. These are people who uh, covered up things about, you know, specifically opioids, uh, to make billions of dollars and cause the epidemic that we are in right now. Yeah. And when you want to talk about drug cartels too, fine. But other than that, for the most part, people who are using substances, people who are dealing substances, it's people who are not doing very well. Right they are struggling. And so if you want to just blame people for that, it's, it's really low. It's really shallow. It's, it's easy to do. Um, there is a law I saw on the table for New York. It's called, I believe Larry's law. And it's about, it's about imposing like manslaughter charges on dealers who sell to someone who then overdoses and dies. And they say that they want to target mid to upper level dealers, which doesn't make sense to me, first of all. If you're a mid to upper level dealer, then how are you selling directly to the person who's using? Right. And they think that that's going to have some sort of deterrent effect. And uh, it's it's not. Obviously, this tough on crime fear approach has not worked. And what you're going to end up doing is you're going to end up locking up people who could possibly be helped, who could possibly right. be saved. Yes, I sold drugs. People sold drugs to me. Uh, people I sold drugs to sold drugs. And what we all mostly had in common was that we were all addicted. And when you run in those circles, people do things. And there are other ways people do things, too. People who clear out their parents' bank accounts, people who rob from other people and mm-hmm. commit violent crimes and, and things like that. And so if you want to just look to lock people up and blame other people, instead of trying to get to a real solution of, of treatment, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to stand with you. And so this, this law that's on the table, and I believe it's, it's being pushed by a mother whose son overdosed. Mm-hmm. And so 
I can't imagine what that's like uh, to, to go through that. And I can very easily understand why you would have anger towards the person who sold that drug. I can even understand how you think that this law is going to, to help. But uh, when emotion gets in the way, sometimes it doesn't come out with a, a logical result. Yeah. Well, it's also like I understand the logic of deterrence, but if an addict were operating on logic, then they wouldn't be doing a lot of the things they do. Correct. So when you're when you when you come up with logical solutions to an illogical disease, it doesn't always come out the way you think it's going to. Right? Yeah. You're thinking in a you're thinking in a way assuming that this person who's suffering is also thinking logically. And that's just not the case, right? As they say, uh, you can't reason someone out of a position they didn't reason themselves into. Yeah, correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and it's it's a uh, there's a there's a lot there's a lot going on when it when it comes to to that issue. And this is again where my my law degree comes into play and things I want to do, not just with defending individual people, but with policy as yeah. as a whole. And that's a law that I saw that's on the table in New York. I believe it was passed through the Senate or the Assembly, and, and it's it's trying to move forward, but things got slowed down with COVID, and and I'm definitely not for it. I do I do give my condolences to that to that mother and, and to their family, but I don't think that that's what you should be doing, especially since what's going to end up happening is you're going to end up targeting users. Because right. Users sell to each other. We always do. And that's just the way it works. When you're stuck in it, you're stuck in it. And you're going to do whatever it is you have to do to maintain your addiction. And people find different ways. And so I, that's just not something that I can support. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were just, when you were talking about the blame stuff in your book, and you mentioned, like, of course, I can't blame this person because the cycles and all of that. But also on a personal level, until you take responsibility you're not going to really fix the underlying problems. So I was reading that part of your book and then came across um, this quote from Stoicism. I don't know if you've ever read any like Marcus Aurelius or any of the Stoic philosophers, but the quote was, um, you can make a persuasive case that all your troubles are the fault of others. You will convince some people. You might even convince yourself. Are your troubles now solved? And it's kind of like the, you know, yes, if we blame the pharmaceutical companies for, you know, people get addicted through pills and then they go to the cheaper stuff on the streets and all of that. Blaming in that sense is to aiming to fix a problem. But on the personal level, at some point, like you had to have probably a, a meeting with yourself deep down and say, I'm changing course, you know, what, eight years ago, right? Was Yeah, so I, what celebrated, was, what, I celebrated eight years on September 30th. That's, a, oh, that's a couple, like a week ago. Yeah. 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 Congrats. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So, so would you agree with that kind of stoic way where you take personal responsibility and blame, like even in the, in the worst case where you're the victim of a crime or something that, that thinking you're of yourself, like of, as a victim and like somebody else did something to me, it keeps you f just further from actually, you know, personally solving something. Yes, of course. So let's just even say, let's talk about Purdue Pharma, a big pharmaceutical company that's been sued uh, by, and there's other pharmaceutical companies as well that have been sued by states uh, for all the damage and resources that they've had to put into fighting the opioid epidemic because of them marketing drugs like Oxycontin as non-addictive, right? And so let's even say that you are someone who's actively addicted and you uh, are a victim of the pharmaceutical company. And mm -hmm. what do you think they're gonna give you? They're, are they gonna take away your addiction? Are they gonna take away what happened? No, you're gonna get money. And if you're actively addicted right. to drugs and your the settlement is, is money, um, most likely what you're gonna do with that money is then just go buy more drugs. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't get it, uh, but even if that's, you know, if, if if the pharmaceutical companies are, are blamed, they're held responsible, they have to pay billions in damages. If you don't work on yourself, 
if you don't take personal responsibility, you're still left with this addiction. Right. And so you can do all of that and, and play the blame game, but it's not going to get you anywhere. Uh, it's yeah. really not. Even those who have that malicious intent, like pharmaceutical companies, most dealers that I have come into contact with do not have that malicious intent. It's most of the time, it's people who are addicted to drugs themselves. Yeah. yeah, you get higher up the food chain. Sure, you might come into contact with some of those people. But for the most part, everyone who I bought and sold from were addicts themselves. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so I guess we should get a definition on the table of addiction. I've seen like um, different ways of expressing it. Um, you wrote in your book like that you were um, doing mostly weed, alcohol, cocaine, Xanax, and then not until senior year of high school did opioids enter the, the mix. And you said, before that day, I never realized that a person could fall in love with a drug. Um, would you say that, that that is the mechanism of addiction? Like you, you, something in your brain literally falls in love with the, the substance and what it does? That is one way of putting it. So addiction is a very complicated definition, right? Because some people will say... To me, addiction is once I start, I cannot stop. Some people will say addiction is when you use substances, bad things happen in your life, right? Mm -hmm. So you might be someone who only drinks, let's say two weekends out of the month, and you will drink on a Friday and a Saturday, just one, two, two Fridays and two Saturdays in an entire month. And every time you drink, you get blackout drunk. You crash your car. You get in a fight with your significant other. You don't show up to work the next morning. You possibly get arrested. Would you call that person an alcoholic, even though maybe they're not physically dependent on it, even though they only drink four times a month? Would you call that person an alcoholic? I would. Yeah. The same alcoholic that has to wake up every single morning and take a swig of vodka just to, just to calm their nerves and, and stop the shakes. No, it's not. But Again, it's how is it affecting your life? So right. it's and it's it's difficult for to come up with a single definition for it because what's acceptable to one person is not to another, right? Some people are perfectly okay with getting blackout drunk on the weekends as long as they go to work Monday through Friday and they pay their bills and they don't they do everything else they're supposed to do. They're totally fine with getting blackout drunk on the weekends or even drinking during the week. It's called like your functioning alcoholic. And so right. there are all different levels of addiction. And that's why I really focus on the consequences of your use. That's to me is really the most important thing. How is this use affecting your life? Mm. How is it affecting your life? Right. And so uh, I'm sure you may have, you may remember, I missed our grandfather's funeral because I was going through Oxycontin withdrawals, right? right. Uh, and that obviously affected not just my life, but my entire family's life, right? Which is why we say addiction is a family disease because it yeah. affects a lot more than just a person who's actually using. And so there's really no denying when it's that serious that this is causing a, a, a major problem for you. Yeah. In some ways, it's actually even easier to define this person as someone suffering from addiction or a substance use disorder when it's completely out of control like mine was. Like there's really no, it's not really very, it's not subjective. Like it's pretty objective. It's like this person needs help, right? It's actually even more difficult when they're kind of on the fence where like they are not getting arrested and they have a job and they're drinking and maybe they're smoking a little bit bad things are happening, but things aren't really out of control. That one's actually tougher because yeah. people can get away with it a little bit more. That's true. right. It's more at that, like the person has to know inside their own head, like uh, what, what lies are they telling themselves or maybe what friendships are deteriorating because they're being a piece of shit in some way. Like, like you said, if you get blackout on a weekend, chances are you're not being your best self when you're blacked out. Like, People, when they're blacked out drunk, like they have that empty look behind their eyes where they're not even there. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the most terrifying things like to see when 
you you look at somebody who's not there who you know you know um but yeah that's a good point um do you know the um uh, he's a canadian physician i don't know how to say his last name but gabor mate or something like that no um he's like some addiction specialist and his approach is always that addiction is a problem but it's usually covering up some other problem and the point is like if you look at somebody who was arrested for dealing or even you know something violent because they were addicted and got caught up in the wrong circles what underlying problem caused that were so his vibe is always like um it's covering up some kind of pain and then it creates more pain that you have to cover up and you get caught in this like feedback loop of covering up and then i guess that's the rock bottom moment is to sort of say okay i'm going to reset and finally deal with some things and try to rebuild a totally new version of my personality do do you well one do you agree with that um idea that like a lot of addiction starts from a place of pain and trying to cover that up and would you say you had to like kind of rebuild your personality um after your rock bottom moment yeah, so I'll start with that addiction comes from a place of pain. I would add fear to that mm. as well, right? So, and the two are kind of, are definitely intertwined, but when it comes to the onset, right, it's it's very easy to understand it when someone had a traumatic event in their life, let's just say as, as a child, and then they turn to substances to numb the pain to deal with those very uncomfortable feelings, right? So it's very straightforward in, in those situations. I think it's easier for people to understand, but sometimes there isn't trauma uh, as the onset. Sometimes the person suffers from anxiety and they're anxious all the time. And then they find a drug and they're not so anxious anymore. Maybe the person is depressed. And then all of a sudden they take a drug and they come out of their depression. Maybe the person is insecure, struggles with friends. And then all of a sudden they find a group of friends who get high and use drugs together. And now they have some sort of identity. They have some sort of purpose. And so it could really be onset in, in a lot of different ways. And yeah, there's different kinds of, of pain and, and fear too, right? The fear of of not being able to fit in. I can tell you, I remember my dad did this to me. After I had gotten arrested, I, I went into treatment and he, after a month, he printed out my cell phone bills from the month prior I got to that, that I got arrested when I was dealing and using. And the month after I got arrested when I was in treatment and I was no longer dealing or using. Mm -hmm. And my phone bill, my phone records went from like a hundred pages while I was using and dealing to one when I wasn't. Mm -hmm. Basically what that meant to me was that I didn't really have very many real friends and family. Okay. I was basically only a user and a dealer. And at the very least, at least I had some sort of identity, some sort of purpose. And without that, who was I? I was, right. no, I was no one. And that was terrifying. And That's a good metaphor of seeing that like all your social connections disappeared as soon as you decided I want to be clean. One, one page was the cell phone bill. Uh, and it was probably like your mom, dad, and brother. Or something, yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> no my offense. Probation, and my probation <laughs> officer. Yeah. Like that's, that's, that's pretty much it. And so I think that's that's really a big part of what I struggled with was identity and, and purpose. I can tell you that at 22 years old was when I really started going in, in, in a different direction because I remember there was a party and a bunch of my friends had just graduated college and they're getting jobs, they're starting to, they're starting careers, they're successful, and I had nothing nothing. I was a drug addict. I was a drug dealer. I was a gambler. I was a bookie. And you can't really admit that like, you know, I just got a promotion. Like it doesn't work that way. And I just got a new job. So people would ask, what are you doing? Are you in school? Are you working? And I would have no response. I would say something like, oh, I'm just trying to stay out of trouble. 
And eventually you don't want to be around people who aren't living your lifestyle. That's very, very uncomfortable. I was more fearful of hanging out with law abiding citizens than I was hanging out with people who were using drugs and selling drugs and yeah. putting myself in dangerous situations that was, or driving down the Palisades Parkway with enough Oxycontin in my trunk to, to get some serious time in prison. Right. That didn't scare me. What scared me was walking into a room of people who are law abiding, non-drug users who have jobs and who have careers. And I felt like they could just walk, see right through me. Right. Right. Walk yeah. in the room and there he is drug addict. And by them seeing through you, it was also a mirror for you to see yourself in a way you probably didn't want to at the time. Correct. And and you you would go you you go back and forth with it, right? You are so ashamed of who you are, and then you get high, and then you can convince yourself oh, this is fine, and that uh, I'm a drug dealer, and, and I'm gonna be this is who I'm gonna be. I'm hard, and, and and then you then you go through withdrawals, and you're like, I never want to do this again. I hate this lifestyle, and then then you get high, and you're like, it's fine, and then then you get arrested and then you're going through withdrawals in jail. And then you're like, I'm never going to do this again. And then you do it again. And it's just a vicious cycle of yeah. up mm -hmm. and down and up and down. And it's just, it's exhausting. Yeah. I have a question. So we talked about fear being the underlying emotion or pain, but I was just curious. Um, so they're pres prescribing opioids for wisdom teeth surgeries in America, which is just out of question from where I'm from. Like if you're in pain, just take an Advil. Like, you know, no one prescribes anything like that. So I was just, I think my question is like, do you think there's also some people that are getting addicted to this in a physical way? Like how much of it is physical? How much of it is like a psychological addiction? Like, yeah, um, so that's, a, that's a great question because there's, there's both for sure. I can tell you that the mental obsession is worse than the physical withdrawals. Because mm -hmm. the physical part of it, yes, if you're abusing drugs for a long period of time, you're going to go and you just stop at the beginning, especially you're going to go through some serious withdrawal and you're going to just feel like you have the flu and it's just not going to be, uh, it's not going to be fun at all. And your body's going to go through different changes. They even say that if you are abusing op drugs like opioids for an extended period of time, you go through those immediate withdrawals, and then you go through what's called post-acute withdrawal symptoms. And that those can last for up to two years where your, your body's just detoxing itself and going through all these different changes, right? So two years, Jesus. Yes, two years. Um, if you're using, and of course you can, you can knock that down by eating healthy, by exercising, by drinking water, by getting counseling, by doing all the things you need to do to support your recovery. But, uh, yeah, your body goes through major changes. Opioids are a very, very powerful drug. And so you become physically dependent on it. And that's like the physical withdrawal part of it. But the mental obsession, <clears throat> at least for me, was far worse than the physical part of it, right? So if you use opioids for an extended period of time, doesn't matter who you are, you are going to go through physical withdrawals. It's just, it will happen to everyone but not everyone is going to become mentally obsessed the way I was. It's just mm -hmm. not going to happen for everyone. There's varying degrees. The longer you use it for, the more likely you are to become addicted. The younger you start, the more likely you are to become addicted as your brain is still developing. It's much more vulnerable to becoming addicted. And that's just, that's just kind of the science behind it and, and the way that it works. But yeah, a lot of times, I mean, that's really how it started for me was we had heard about oxycodone and we were trying to get our hands on them, but they were very difficult to find. We found a leftover prescription, did it that way. And then over the course of my senior year, I would say uh, probably around like 10 times or so, I would we, I would get, get my hands on like a, a leftover prescription from somebody and it's mm -hmm. wisdom teeth or surgeries. And, you know, then eventually you find dealers who get them through a lot of different means, um, how I was able to, towards the end of my addiction, how I was able to get my hands on the amount of oxycodone that I was is truly insane. Um, yeah. Because if you're, 
you know, if you're only getting them in a prescription, then how do you get your hands on that many? They had to be coming from, you know, I would get manufacturer bottles. They were never even given to a specific person. Like they would come, they look like they would be the type of things that would get shipped to pharmacies and right. I would get my hands on those, you know, and, and it's a very, it's a lucrative business for someone who's not addicted. It is. If, if, if you're selling oxycodone and you're not using it, you can make a ton of money and, and where there's that opportunity, there's always going to be corruption. And that's yeah. I guess, really how I was able to get my, my hands on so many of them. But yeah, I mean, a lot of the times it, it does start from a simple surgery. Uh, you know, you break your arm, you break your leg, the wisdom teeth, and and someone becomes physically addicted if they take them for long enough. And maybe after that physical addiction, they go through like a little bit of withdrawals and they haven't been using for an extended period of time. It might end there, but that's not the story for everyone. You know, it yeah. starts with the physical and then it gets to the mental. And once you have that mental obsession, it's it's extremely difficult to to break. Yeah. There seems to be some kind of unlucky factor too. Like, so she had a surgery on her arm in 2017. And I remember she took the first, like as the, the nerve block was wearing off on her arm, we were in the parking lot at Trader Joe's going to get some like food and like bunker up at her place. And so she popped in the first pill. They gave like 30 pills. I, and, I never taken any like painkillers before prior to that. So I'm like, Oh, a medicine, like a whole pill. Let me just take one. And, Anyway, you can, you can well, I mean, you, you can tell whatever, but we were walking through Trader Joe's and all of a sudden I was like, what the hell happened? Like, she was just like frozen in front of like a shelf, just like, like look like something left her brain. And, and then we started driving home and then immediately she threw up everywhere and was just like, fuck that. I'd rather be in pain than experience that whatever happened. And I had a similar reaction. I took when I had wisdom teeth out, it, it like the drug just did not match up with my body well. And I hated the experience. You talk about the euphoria you felt from that first pill you took in like a high school math class. Like, do you think there's just an element of luck to who, whose body seems to like really yeah. grab onto it or something? There, there is a genetic component to it, but it's not determinative. Meaning, yes, if you have a history of addiction in your family, you may be more likely to become addicted because you have a genetic predisposition and you're vulnerable to it. But it doesn't mean that it's going to happen. And if you come from a family where there's no addiction, it doesn't mean that it can't happen to you. Right. Right? So there is definitely that genetic predisposition, but you don't really know until you take it, Right three different people take the same drug and you get three different reactions. How does that happen? Because everyone's body is differently. I can tell you that the drug makes people nauseous all the time. And I can tell you, and this is going to sound insane to someone who's not an opioid addict or a recovering opioid addict like me. But when I would take at the beginning, especially when I would take a lot of opioids, I would, uh, get nauseous and I would throw up too. And I, I, I enjoyed throwing up. Right. You wrote about that in the book. I you were like that. throwing up in a bush outside your house and you were kind of laughing and enjoying it despite the fact, and that people sh should realize if throwing up is one of the worst things ever. You just, yeah, I had food poisoning last year and I hadn't thrown up as like Jerry Seinfeld almost set a record for 10 years. <laughs> like I had been a while since I threw up and like, I was just like, this is the worst. Like you're just all of those muscles clamping down. Like it's, it's, it's a good um, marker to, to convince people like how twisted the mind has to become in an addiction to actually, or maybe just is it the power of the, the drug that, you were in such a euphoria that even throwing up was just pleasurable. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it's, it's insane to really think about, but, uh, it would happen to me sometimes over the course of my opioid addiction and towards the end. Now there was no more nausea. Uh, you know, towards the end, it wasn't so much about getting high. It was much more about not being sick. And there's a difference between the two, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you first start using, you just, get you know you get very very high very under the influence and you get these these feelings that 
you end up chasing for a long period of time, but your body builds up tolerance to it. You need more to achieve the same effect. And then even with that, you just, you never get there. And so you end up chasing a feeling that is no longer even obtainable. It's a very carrot on a stick kind of thing, right? Yeah, it is. And you can even convince yourself that the feeling that you got at the beginning was better than it actually is, right? Like you can convince yourself that this substance will do something to you that is so enjoyable that I need to go back to it. And then you do it and it's not nearly what you thought, what you convinced yourself it is. That's that brain disease part of it is I could actually convince myself. I remember like when I tried quitting smoking cigarettes, I would, I would go, I would struggle with that. Right. I've been free of substances for eight years, but nicotine was not, was the only one that's not one of them. And in recovery circles, we don't count nicotine as a drug in terms of sobriety, uh, but it is a drug. Don't get me wrong, but not in terms of sobriety, do we count it? And so I've only been nicotine free for six years. And I struggled with that for a long period of time. And I would have like brief periods where I wouldn't smoke. And then I would convince myself that smoking cigarettes is, has such a great feeling. And then you realize, at least for me, when I would smoke cigarettes sober, they were not enjoyable at all. They mm. tasted terrible. They smelled awful. I wanted nothing to do with it, but I would convince myself that it was going to be the same type of experience I had when I was high on heroin or high on Oxycontin, which is a completely different experience because of the, you know, the dual substances working together. Uh, right. So like your brain paired them together as like yeah, memory. And that's, and, and that's, you know, mixing substances is really where you see those overdoses skyrocket. Like we're seeing today with, with heroin laced with fentanyl or, alcohol and any other type of pill or powder really increases your risk of overdose and death for sure. Yeah. So I have a lot of, um, another question about the previous topic actually. So we said, um, you know, just wait, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> wait a second. What was I saying? Um, we can move on. I'll remember <laughs> and say, um, <laughs> so you say at one point in the book, um, but my battle with substance abuse also made me the man I am today. And that's a, it's a funny thing when you, um, look on a, the past and you say, okay, here's shitty things that happened to me or shitty things I've done. And, and then you have this emotion of regret. And then in some sense, the emotion of regret doesn't make sense because things that happened already happened. You can't change them, but then it's like, okay but I can kind of mine through the past and learn from mistakes. And then it's about the future being different and all of that. It's a, it's a weird thing of like, well, you wouldn't want to go through that experience if you could like write a new simulation of what reality is, but yet you're happy with where you've arrived and where, who you are now depends on you having gone through that. Like, how do you think about that reflecting on the past and, kind of accepting bad things that you've done or that's happened to you versus wanting it to not be, you know what I mean? Like you wouldn't be you're doing referring, your mission. You're referring to a question I was asked. And this was actually one of the first times I spoke um, after I had started my own, my own company, Speak Sobriety. And I, I had spoke at a school in New Jersey, I believe it was Garfield High School. And a student asked me that question. He said, if you can go back and change one thing, would you even change it? Because if you changed it, then you wouldn't have had this life experience and you wouldn't be here speaking to us today. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I didn't really know how to answer that question. I had never thought about that deeply. And then over the course of like my next few speaking engagements, it, it happened again at the end of this that school year. I was asked that question by an eighth grade girl, like almost exactly the same way. And she was like thinking about it. She was like, because someone had asked, I believe it was a teacher who asked, like, if you can go back and speak to your older self, what would you tell yourself? And then I said, you know, I, I would say that the decisions I make today can and will affect me for the rest of, of my life. And while I'm not going into it with the intention of becoming a drug addict, uh, drugs and alcohol have a way of messing up people's plans. And you draw that line in the sand 
And as your brain becomes more and more addicted, you just keep erasing that line and pushing it back until there's no line at all, right? But then the girl thought about that and she was like, okay, so, but what if you did go back and you, and you stopped yourself from doing it? Then you wouldn't be here today speaking to us. You wouldn't have this story. You wouldn't be able to help other people. So how do you, how do you think about that? And, and that's deep, right? Because now you're thinking about your addiction, not only as your, your burden, but now as your, as your blessing. And that's, right. that's, that's crazy, right? That's crazy because at the height of my addiction, it was so bad. It was so bad for so many people. And I would never wish addiction on anyone. And if I did have the opportunity, right? If I had to go back to 13 years old and they were like, all right, you can take this drink and this drug and, and go down this path again and, and, and you will eventually recover, but you're going to have to go through like 10, 11 years of hell. I would not right. try to go through that again. I would not. I and would it's choose. one thing to reflect on yourself. It's another to be like, I also caused chaos around me to the people yeah. I love and family and friends and stuff. It's such a hard equation though. Um, it, to bring up stoicism again, I'm reading this book by William Irvine called A Guide to the Good Life. And it's sort of like a summary of different Stoic philosophers. And he says sort of like in a zoomed out way, Stoicism is about looking at your past and deciding, is this a blessing or a curse? And it's very similar to what we were saying earlier with the blame game. It's like, if you can frame something as a blessing, now you've used that to become a better person. And if you view it as a curse, then, you know. Turning your mess into a message. Uh, oh, sounds like you had that free package ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> I actually uh, I actually heard that from a high school principal. Her name is Carissa Brzezinski. She is the principal at uh, Elwood John Glenn High School out in Long Island. Where, oh, uh, close by, yeah. Yes, yes. And so... She brought me in to speak my first year. She gave me a shot. And then uh, last year, I got to go back again. And I spoke to the, I spoke again at the high school. And the people who I had spoke with as a freshman were now seniors. And it was cool because like some of them even remembered me from when I was, from when they heard me speak when I was a freshman. And I spent the entire day with her in her office and some of her administrative staff. And we just talked about so many different things. It was like the day before Valentine's Day and everyone had a break. So she kind of like left the day open and, and we got to have a lot of great discussions. And that was one thing she said to me. She was like, you found a way to turn your, your mess into a message. And I just, it just kind of like clicked in my brain. And I was like, wow, you know, I never really thought about it like that. Right. And so, yeah. you know, like my, my experience as a drug user and a dealer selling to support my habit and live that was a, a burden and it caused chaos. And now as someone in recovery, it is my blessing and it's given me the opportunity to give people hope and to, and to help other people. And so you get, you take the same journey, but two different parts of it are doing right. completely different things. And when you really stop and think about it, it, it becomes very emotional. It becomes very deep. And it's, it's really, it's, it's mind blowing where you can really start uh, to think about all of these things and, and where it can go, right? Like if we, I'm, I'm a big prevention advocate, right? That's really what I'm trying to do. I do help families who have someone who's already, who's already suffering, try and come up with the best long-term treatment plan because of all the mistakes that me and my family made. I, I know how to navigate treatment. I know how to give someone their best chance in recovery. I know how to get the family in a, in a position to help their, their loved one who's suffering, right? But I am a huge advocate in, in prevention. And I think about how these things can really play out, right? Like if you, and we are, uh, this will never happen and we're a long way from it, but like if you like almost effectively eliminated addiction, the few people who were left addicted would feel so alone right? Mm -hmm. Because right now there's so many people who are addicted, which means there's more people in recovery. But like, if you almost eliminate it, it will get to a point where people can't really relate to it anymore. And it's, it's just, it's, it, it gets so crazy when you start, when you start to think about prevention and treatment and 
addiction and recovery and, and the purpose of it all and, right. and what it is that I'm doing and what I'm trying to do. Well, it's almost like um, you're lucky that you didn't just personally find sobriety, but you also found a deeper meaning in life by by having this message from your mess. Like that probably helps you more than anything to stay sober, right? That that you're you're you know this is feel. I, we we were with our friend the other day and sort of like late night, like what's the meaning of life kind of thing came up, and. I think we settled on something like to be the best version of yourself so that you can serve others. And like, it seems like that you, you found like the perfect motivation to be your best sober self because you have this message and there's a crisis in the country. And that's your message is exactly what people, if they hear it early enough, you, you literally might be steering them away from a path that you had to go down. Yeah. And I, I uh, I've had a few experiences over the years where I've had like direct feedback on how my presentation impacted someone mm. and that to me in a positive way. And yeah. that to me is, is the great, is one of the greatest gifts. And I've had some, some crazy experiences over the years. I spoke not last year, last year was a follow-up. So two school years ago, I spoke at a Catholic school up in Binghamton and I got to do an assembly there. It was grade seven through 12, big assembly, whole school was there, went really well. Like one of the best Q and A's I've ever had. And I stayed the whole day. I was, I stayed the whole day with, with a student assistance counselor and it was Cindy Edwards and, and we had such a great day together. And then I left and it turned out that like 15 minutes after I left, there was a girl from not that school, but the local high school, uh, her and her friend were like walking right by the, the Catholic school and she was hit by a car and she was killed. And the person was under the influence and it was, you know, it was drug and alcohol related. And she called me the next day and she was like, we just had a big meeting uh, in, the, in the gym again, similar to like the assembly and, and students are standing up in there they're quoting you. They're quoting the things you said and how everything you were talking about literally came to life 15 minutes after you left. Mm. And it's just, I didn't even know how to feel. It's like you're, you're being quoted and, and, and you're, you're realizing that your, your presentation has just like come to life and it's helping other people. But at the same time, a girl just lost her life. Yeah. And it's, it's just like, I've had things like that happen uh, you know, positive, mostly positive, but like sometimes like just things that you just like can't really come to terms with or wrap, or wrap your head around. Right. Like, like yesterday I was in a conference and, and uh, there was a school counselor in there who had uh, booked me to speak like two years ago too. And she wrote something really nice in there to, to, for everyone to hear. Like uh, he came to my school two years ago, he spoke, it was really great. Everyone loved it. And then she wrote, and I gave your book to one of my students who, and, and now they're uh, in school to be a drug and alcohol counselor. Mm. So like, you hear these stories like years afterwards that like directly impact you. And, and you know that like what you did helped someone. Uh, right. You're getting signals like I'm on the right path. Yeah. This is good. And, and don't get me wrong. When, when, the, when, when COVID hit, I mean, I went, I did an assembly on March 9th in the morning. And in the morning, we did an assembly and everything seemed fine. I went home in the afternoon and I came back for the afternoon assembly. And the assistant principal basically and principal said to me, like, I think this is the last assembly we're ever going to do. Uh, we have an emergency meeting, emergency superintendent's meeting. I think we're closing schools. Oh. And like it happened that fast. And yeah. so uh, that was March 9th. And then I remember I was sitting in my car trying not to get a parking ticket in Brooklyn because it was alternate side parking day. And so you <laughs> sit in your car, they won't give you a ticket. And so I was sitting there and uh, a few days later and all of a sudden emails just started coming in and I was booked to speak every single day from March 22nd to April 3rd and every single event was canceled. And then I had a lot of stuff to do uh, with pre-prom. I do a lot of stuff around prom season because it's, you know, it's very relevant. 
all mm-hmm. those got canceled. It was like 30 something events and every one of them was canceled. None rebooked virtually. And so I was like, that's it. It's, it's, this is it. It's run its course. It's over. And <clears throat> I was like, all right, so I guess this is my transition into law. I'm going to, I'm just going to go full time and just try and get a job. Maybe a prosecutor or a defense attorney, or maybe, maybe a job in, in, as a corporate lawyer. And I'm not going to do anything like this ever again. You know, I, I did my piece. I'm just going to move on. And in my heart, that just did not feel right at all. Mm. There was just no, like it just couldn't happen. And then finally in August, I had a prevention coalition reach out to me in Connecticut who had seen me speak live uh, in January, right before COVID hit. And she booked me for my first like virtual community event and it went very well. And and since then now I've been doing a lot of stuff virtually and I've been able to, to reach people from all over the place. Right. I, I did one in Connecticut, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Georgia. I'm doing one in North Carolina, California, Arizona, Washington. So like you get to now, travel anywhere virtually. Yeah. Yeah. And so I had, <clears throat> I had thought about doing that. I thought about possibly after law school, putting the, 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 you know, practicing law on hold and possibly going on some type of national tour and speaking to middle schools, high schools, and parents, and community coalitions, and hospitals, and doctors, all over the place, right? And I was going to do it because I just feel it's so relevant right now, and uh, I'm young enough where I'm still relatable to, to the students, and old enough to where I have the credibility to speak to people who are older than me. So I just felt that this was like the perfect time to do it, uh, and then COVID hit, and so this is one way I'm able to kind of reach uh, yeah. wider audiences is, is through virtual. It's funny that you say, um, you know, you kind of pictured, you almost like pictured the path you could take if you just abandoned this um, speak sobriety thing and go full-time law. And then your brain was just like, nope, that's not an option. Like, I think, I think as I get older, I realize we have an instinct towards meaningful things, whatever that word meaningful means. Um, it's hard to define in like a succinct way, but I think it's an instinct we have that it's like, you can feel that that path will lead to good things. And you can probably, like I was saying before, if you, if you abandoned the speak sobriety thing, it would, it would only hurt your sobriety. Right. I I would, I would think so. You know, I, I, it wouldn't hurt it in a way where I, I think I would relapse because of it, <clears throat> but it is, I, I kind of accepted it that maybe at, at one point I would kind of part ways with this. Um, at least I wouldn't be doing it t- to the extent that I'm doing it right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think maybe as I get older, I would serve someone of a different purpose than I, I, I do right now. But I just, I put so much time and effort into this and it's, it's mine, right? I don't work for somebody else. It's not somebody else's company. It's, I'm not an employee. Like this is like, this is mine. Like I, I, I created it all by myself. Uh, I did, I've literally done everything by myself. Um, Mm -hmm. and you know, with, with some help from other people in terms of like guidance, but like I did, you know, everything, uh, for the most part by myself. And so this is not just, it's not just like some company. It's, it's, it's me. Yeah. My purpose is my mission. And so, and it's a naked version of you because your stories and what you write in the book, and I'm sure in the presentations, it's brutally honest. So that yeah. probably makes it feel extra personal to. It is, it is, it is. And I think that sometimes I, I struggle with separating the two and mm-hmm. I take my work a little bit too personally. And I think that's okay. When it, when it's when it's something that you're this passionate about to take your work a little bit too personally sometimes I mean you can't let it control your life and you get upset at certain things uh, and I think I've done a pretty good job with that yeah but you know it's 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 more than just a job and just a company for me yeah so I think my last question would be you talk about um, being both sober and clean yeah and can you describe what you mean by that how somebody can be sober but not clean 
Yeah. So lately, and uh, I understand why people think this way, and, and I may have to adjust my language a little bit. So there are some people who don't like the term clean and sober anymore. And when I wrote this book, I had never even heard about the reason why. And it does make a little bit of sense. Uh, some people don't like the term clean and sober because by saying that you're clean now, it infers that you were dirty before and dirty in a way that contributes to stigma, right? And so I didn't think about that then. And so I don't really say that the, the word clean as much uh, anymore. I just really say sober. But what I meant by it in, in the book and when, the reason why I would say it is because you can be sober, meaning not using drugs and alcohol, but you can still be living your life in a dishonest way. Mm -hmm. And so that's more what I refer to, to the clean part of it. Um, I guess you can maybe instead say honest and sober or dishonest and so yeah right yeah I, I think maybe that would be a, a better choice of words and and you know i i learn things as i go along too some people are trying to get away from the word substance abuse and then instead say substance misuse because they don't like how abuse comes i see across and that one i don't really agree with uh because i don't know how you can misuse heroin that implies that you can use it right. safely. Uh, so I, that's why for, for that part of it, I don't like, but just to get back to, to the, the, the clean and sober part of it and why I, I worded it that way, my, my purpose, my intention for doing it is that it's not just about not using drugs and alcohol. Yeah. It's got I think what I interpreted when, when I, what I wrote in my notes here, when I saw that phrase, I interpreted clean as like moral or principled, like, like having principles and sticking to them which yeah, honesty I, would be one of the big ones, right? I think, I think that that is a better way of putting it uh, now that I'm just speaking about it right now. And it's because uh, I had read that. Uh, I read that a few years ago, I think, um, like right after I published this book, I read something about why clean and sober could contribute to stigma a little bit. And, and I kind of agreed with it. Um, so I think maybe honest and sober is, is, is a better way of <clears throat> Yeah, a better way of putting it. And with honesty, it means you're fully an integrated mind. You're not like segmented, and you don't have this, uh, sh you know, shame like, oh, I'm lying to people I love to, because like even if you're sober, you like I guess another way you could phrase it is you could be a sober asshole, still. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> and like if 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 your goal in life is to be the best person you can be to serve others, then part of that is to not be an asshole and to be honest and grounded in morals and principles and stuff mm -hmm. and be sober, right? Yep, for sure. Now, would you say for most people um, who aren't um, feeling addicted personally, um, like in other words, the zero tolerance thing, like is your message more just like, like, do you have zero tolerance towards certain substances? And then for the general population, you would say, just here's my story so you can catch yourself early before you might spiral into something? Yeah, every, you know, addiction, addiction treatment, recovery, it is very individualized, right? Because, like, there's there's drug of choice, right? Some, like, I could never be an alcoholic. It just, it just couldn't happen. I don't like the feeling of being drunk. I never have. I never will. And in some ways, uh, a lot of ways, actually, it's a blessing because like, I don't look at someone who's drunk and be like, oh, man, I'm missing out. I more look at someone who's drunk and I'm just like, shut up and stop talking. To me. <laughs> and that, that's really yeah. it. So uh, I, I really I don't I'm never jealous of someone who's who's out drinking and getting drunk. Like there is no part of it that is appealing to me, especially as a sober person, you feel like. You know, what it's like to be the smartest person in the room very, very quickly when you're sober and everybody else is drunk. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's 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 so hard when it because when it, it's it's so individualized and uh, it's, you know, it, it is somewhat of a, of, of a subjective thing in yeah. terms of uh, addiction and, and both you know, the addiction, the treatment, the, the recovery. It's it's so individualized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a, a good point i mean i i've i've heard different interviews with people where they they talk about 
if you have too strict of a zero tolerance, like you can't touch any of these things, it's like people are humans. They're going to they're gonna do what they're going to do. If you give more of a moderate message of like, y- you might not be affected. Maybe your friend will. Maybe your family member will be. It might not be this substance. It could be that one. It might not be at age 15. It might be at age 40. Like there's too many details. It's more like you have to be aware that the human aware. mind can f- fall into aware. these traps. Yeah, and, and that your actions can also influence other people, right? If yeah. you're the parent who hosts the underage drinking party and you're saying, oh, well, I just want to give my kids a safe place to drink and and maybe your kids aren't the one with the issue, but then you give someone who comes from a broken home and is depressed and has trauma and is using substances, you give them a place to use, right? And so, uh, yeah, I don't take a zero tolerance approach. I have friends who drink alcohol. I have some friends who smoke marijuana and live productive lives. I have some friends who are prescribed Adderall. I have some friends who are prescribed Xanax. Some of those people uh, somehow are able to manage it. And some of those people are definitely not. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's, 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 I always lean towards substance free first, but I understand that that's not going to happen. I guess it's much more about harm reduction overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Effectiveness overall too. Let me try to phrase what I was trying to say. Oh, it came back to your mind. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it did. Um, I mean, to just to end on like a high note. So you were, I know we were not playing the blame game. But you were saying they're trying to pass this law targeting the sellers. I was just curious if um, they're doing anything that's actually targeting like the over prescription of these drugs or like is if there's anything that you could change with your law degree, like once you have that, like would that, there be anything that you would like to do? Yeah, so they, they did. They have made some progress on that in terms of um, kind of like eliminating, pay, at least in New York, I believe eliminating paper prescriptions and how everything is automated now. Like people used to be able to do doctor shopping, meaning you can go from Dr. A, then go to Dr. B, C, D, and E, and just keep filling your different prescriptions. Like if you had a legitimate reason um, and and there was no like national database to like track that. And so they've made a lot of uh, improvements with that. The problem is, is you have unintended consequences when you try and solve a crisis, right? So we were in an opioid crisis and people were had had major access to these painkillers. There were pill mills in Florida. They were doctor shopping. They were everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. And so, what did you do? You made those pills much more difficult to get, which means they became more expensive, more more difficult to access. And you had all these people addicted to opioids. So, mm-hmm. what happened? What happened was is more people turned to heroin more quickly. And so, yeah. then all of a sudden, heroin is more dangerous, and now you have even more overdoses. And so it was kind of like a little bit too late type of thing where you try and fix this problem. And it had to happen. It did have to happen. But sometimes when you fix a problem or you're trying to fix a problem, it gets worse before it gets better. And that's what happened in America. You didn't make treatment more accessible, right? All you did was make the pills harder to get. And so you have all these people who are left addicted Again, what was the logical thinking behind that? Oh, well, they can't get the pills. They're going to get sober. No, they're going to find another way. And that's what we did, right? I, I, I used heroin plenty of times. Uh, I'm lucky that I got sober before uh, all the, the access to Oxy uh, became much more difficult, at least for me. And I don't mean to, to minimize how dangerous Oxycontin is, but it's at the very least, it's a controlled substance and you know what you're getting as opposed to heroin, you have no idea. But now even today, and you could take it even a step further, now drug cartels are pressing pills, meaning they're taking fentanyl made by drug cartels and making them look like they're an oxycodone pill. And so you think that it's a controlled substance, but it's really not. And then people are taking a pill thinking it's just 30 milligrams, and it turns out to be uh, a whole bunch of fentanyl in the person. Over- I mean, they're not scientists. They can't no, know no. what they're putting into yeah. the pills. Yeah. That's pretty much it. So. Well, thanks, thanks for coming on the podcast. I'll link your, uh, social media. You're, you're on Instagram. I know any, anywhere else. Yes. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at speak sobrieties, um, for all of them. Cool. And then your website is speak sobriety.com, right? Got it, man. Cool. I'll link all that. Thanks for coming on. And, uh, Thank you. Hopefully see you at a family get together sometime soon. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> yep. I got, you know, I got, I got, now I got to hop on it. I got another zoom call right now with law enforcement officer in Massachusetts. So, all right. Trying to, trying to 
keep moving forward with this. So all right. thanks. One all day right. at a time, as you say, right? Yeah. All right, man. All right. Mm-hmm. See ya. Bye. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of Exploring Kodawari. If you enjoyed it, we hope you'll consider sharing it on social media and with friends. You can also help us out by leaving a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Those help us more than you would think. And if you'd like to help us out in a more substantial way, consider going over to our website to make a donation through PayPal. Links are in the episode notes for this. You can do this as a one-time donation or a recurring monthly donation. All of that support will help us to set aside time in order to create content for the podcast and the blog. And finally, please get in touch with us and say hi, either on social media or privately through email. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening and see you next time.